Okay, so for our next um, panel, we have um, five speakers in my here today. So let me introduce them. Uh, so for our moderator today, we have Marcus, the CEO of the Feather Heads. Yes, you can just come over now. Cool. And for our next speaker, Atom of One Inch, as well as Anna from Cowswap, Cornell of Enzo, as well as Black from Precaution. Okay, guys. Well, uh, thanks everyone for coming um, on another panel this week on Intense. Uh, this time about the future of Intense and, and where things are headed. And uh, we have great panelists um, from all sides of the Intense ecosystem. And I'm super excited to ask uh, questions about what the future of Intense will look like um, and what they think. And if you want to interrupt, Please feel free to do so. Uh, I think you have um, an interesting question or you want to follow up on something, just jump in and um, we keep an open discussion on a small room. Uh, we don't need to keep to a schedule or anything. Uh, so yeah, don't be shy and uh, let's get started. So um, I don't think we need to go over the what is intense and um, what is one and what is power swap, what is ENSO, what is essential. I think many of us probably know. Um, and if you don't, you will hear a little bit more in a second about them. Um, I wanted to ask like, each of you, what do you feel is your responsibility in the ecosystem today and going forward? And, and how do you measure your success uh, for yourself and for the users that, uh, that you're building for? Yeah. Thanks. So. Yes, just a, oh, anyone don't know about Amish, I just want to see if there is verifications. <laughs> so we are top tax aggregator in the system on like different UM chains, about eight. Uh, so regarding the intents, uh, we also have the Inverter protocol, which is quite flexible and like my opinion it's been an implementation of intents already. Just it's called link order, and uh, it's the main use case for this. So I guess we can talk here more. Regarding the like measure of success, right? Uh, yes, we are the best. Like the, a lot, most of the traffic go through our aggregator. We try to protect our user from all these challenges that goes now with the uh, MEF attacks, with the sandwiches to MEF protections. So we have very similar things to our other speaker calls of for the cloud fusion. Also, is doing MEF protection and can. Already in that implementation. So, so like, it looks like, in my opinion, we do our best, and now we like, have one in the market for this like, aggregation and doing this uh, And the limit orders, I don't know how it's called, that execution, <laughs> we need some work for this. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Hey, I'm Anna from Council, and um, you are definitely the number one ex aggregator, but not in the intense space, just to clarify. <laughs> And um, at PowerSwap, it has always been kind of our, at the forefront of our mission to really put the user interest first. So that's kind of how we initially came up with the, with the design, because even like initially we looked in 2017, already into fragmented liquidity, and um, the problem of MEV already was mentioned, I think, initially in 2014 for the first time, and we started to look into batch auctions as a way of how you can actually counter MAV surface, uh, reduce it significantly. And um, that was kind of like our motivation behind building Council. We felt like, okay, let's create a system that allows us to protect users in the most practical and best possible way, because navigating blockchain is already incredibly difficult and it also offers a lot of dangers that normal users that are not deep into crypto don't know how to navigate. And 
and, and attends allow you to essentially abstract a lot of complexity away, um, let users just really express what they want as an outcome, and then let more professional parties take care of this and um, offer them the best possible execution. And it was kind of always like our motivation. And with any new feature that we are adding, we are always having in mind how can we like improve the user experience for the user how can we protect them? How can we make sure that we can offer them the best possible prices? Hey, I'm Grant. I'm the head of growth for Essential. Uh, and I'd also just like to say, any time someone says essentially while they're speaking, Essential is achieving PMF. So, <laughs> didn't mean that. Um, <laughs> so, um, I think like ultimately what we're trying to do is act as to some degree a unifying force in the intent space and not just for the intent space but just for the broader like DeFi and, and DAP space in general. Um, we're working on a bunch of infrastructure and tooling that uh, allows applications to more seamlessly like integrate intents or um, better serve their users with more like simple tooling and, and everything to kind of just like make the experience better for everyone. Um, we're working on a bunch of different things right now. We've uh, started to build out, a, and actually have launched at this point, an NVRC, VRC721, uh, which we've now sort of handed off to the community to work on uh, and share. And so that ERC is designed with intent execution in mind. Um, yeah, we're working on uh, a language specific for solvers as well called YERT, uh, which will make it way easier for solvers to sort of pick up and aggregate these intents. Um, Yeah, I'm Connor, <clears throat> one of the co-founders of Enso. Um, for a definition of success for us, one, offering the most optimal routes as a solver in CowSwap, but number two is kind of expanding this intent space. So we have a lot of smart accounts integrating our API natively to do more complex DeFi interactions. This API and infrastructure was created from our own problem of building one, one UI to inter interact with DeFi. So we actually realized to integrate with DeFi is incredibly complex. Thus, this API was born. So for us, it's enabling other da dApps, cross-chain bridges, and let's say some intent protocols, treasury managers to integrate holistically with DeFi. Awesome, thanks. Any follow-up questions? What did you call the language? Yurt. Yurt. Like a, a yurt that you would live in. Yeah. No relation. <laughs> you live in a No relation. Well, I mean, it, it's a. <laughs> All the solvers have to go and live in the yurt if they want to use it. So it's in the woods somewhere. How much of solvers will do that? That's what I'm here to find out. Uh, for you? It's a nice year. Was your idea? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. They're starting. Yeah. Well, what we often see is like finished solutions, like releases, new products coming out, and then uh, the relative merits uh, being highlighted from systems. What I wanted to ask is like, what's the reason? And, and these systems always always change, right? I think all of the uh, solutions behind uh, that you represent, uh, they constantly change every month, every four months there's, there's changes coming out. Uh, what is a recent change that you made or one that you're making right now? And what motivated that change? And what were the trade-offs that you considered uh, when you made that change? And maybe walk us through the, the thought process, how that came about, and specifically on the intent solving. Thanks, great question. Basically, we now work in, uh, uh, like, with its production, we have our Ubitor for Volume 3. Now we actively work on Ubitor, the like, next version, before. Here, we, again, like to see the crucial thing is the like, gas efficiency. So it's, it's, again, much more gas efficient. We, let's say, combine special smaller key orders with the general execution. Plus, we do some, ex ex I would say, more advanced uh, architecture execution of anything. Our users already allows you to 
field intent. So you have like pre interaction, post interaction. So you can do a stop loss order or take profit order or trading order. We don't actively like promote it on the, our UI side products. So like it's available for most for engineers for the end user. So now we are also thinking how to we build the new version. Plus, I guess we're gonna promote this the uh, end product someday, so the more retail users would have this availability for this. Um, that's why actually maybe we're not the let's say not the top first in the in that aggregation. But if you see the volumes, you will see that like the bigger very bigger <coughs> bigger swaps go through one each, and like less maybe go to, to the other protocols. But uh, in our protocols, we in the we have like settlement layer with a we have not a straight fixed price or fixed line. We have like special proof where on the our backend we can customize it quite quite a lot for different market conditions to provide really like to if you have different price curve, like price decay over the time this condition. And now you can like also attach chain link oracle for this. So to stop trading order, be a bit all this all the market or high the market try to find this whole spike on this. So it's quite the one thing that we work on. So like, going to that like what what's some what how did you design that for example? How did you design that curve? Like what was the motivation? How how did you go about defining uh which curve was like yeah basically when you try to teach something, this is a current spot price, right? And it might happen that uh, market goes up. So you start your limit orders higher than market, then you okay wait for some time. Okay, let's five block past. Is it any like market moving up? No, let's go down, right? Then we okay we remember what was the market. Let's try to go uh, about the same price as the market. And then, okay, it looks like market go down. Let's we need to chase it. Let's go down to try to find the execution. And this, let's say, points curve is adjusted by your amount about the gas price on your chain, about the, sorry, adjusted by the volatility of the pair, current gas price, a lot of things that we try to do this, combine these heuristics. But on the, you can build this your own, so like through the API or through the smart contract, you can do arbitrary whatever you want. Just crazy ideas. This kind of what we would say it has and close to release. And for the future, with this intense, we think of even to build a generic DSL that cover not only like DSL domain specific language for intense, that would cover not only the limit order with all this pretty based post interaction stuff, but let's say I want to do a transfer. I do want to, I want to do a cross chain stuff, but it is like also a very hard story. But it might be not even the just in the protocol, might be even the same like protocol, not as a set of smart contracts, but the compiler for this. So this guy just said it like what was like an hour that there. We think of into some idea around this. Yeah, I think that's that's about the that's <laughs> what's really final of my time. Thank you. Thanks. Um multiple things come to mind. Um but I guess what is maybe most interesting here for the audience and in terms of like the intent landscape, it's um, we launched both what is what we call programmatic orders. It's actually very similar to what you were describing before. Basically, the ability to um, yeah place any order type for the future upfront uh, with one single signing of a transaction for of a message, and um, yeah, basically also allows. DCA or as TWAP orders are already live today. Um, and it also allows you significantly more complex ideas such as rebalancing of your portfolios. It allows you to also um, come up with a very nice strategy for um, collaterals. So if you, for example, have a CDP set up and um, you are at the verge of being under collateralized, you can automatically trigger a transaction that will rebalance, like that will um, buy more collateral to ensure your position. And also the other way around. Imagine your collateral is ETH, ETH is going up currently. So you could actually think about either reducing your collateral or taking a bigger loan out of it. So there's a bunch of options and we also have um, bounties for this for the for this weekend for the hackathon. So we are really excited. There's a few uh, teams already that approached us that they want to build on top of this. 
Um, and then something else is also that we launched CalHooks. And I think this is super relevant because it allows you to now not only have one single intent where you do a swap, but you can combine a bunch of intentions that you want <clears throat> to combine with each other, right? Like if, for example, you first want to uh, withdraw from one of your whatever LP positions, and then you want to do a swap, and then you want to um, put the token somewhere else, or you want to transfer them cross chain. Um, so you have a lot more composability now of what you can do because I think the intent space is really growing like from the sense of initially it started with doing simple swaps and now you as a user have much more flexibility in um, combining a bunch of different actions into one single signature. One question on that. Um, between programmatic I just, uh, I just, uh, <laughs> uh, between uh, programmatic and um, orders and hooks, when you when you launched that, what surprised you? Was it a surprising use case that you didn't expect that the community came up with, or the users came up with, or the developers came up with? Uh, that's quite interesting, maybe to, to mention. Um, I think. Let me think about it. Um, so I wouldn't say super surprising, and we are also like at the beginning of seeing the different use cases that are built on top. Um, one where we definitely found more so on the programmatic order. It's like actually. Now we are um, launching this advanced programmatic order framework where we had like a more basic version of that already like beginning of the year. And um, that really fit in really, really well with DAO use cases. So essentially we had a huge um, uh, trade by ENS, I think it was in February, where they were like transacted $60 million. Um, and that kind of was like, we had already like big players are like whales more in mind because it's like of course this intent it allows you to even if you have large volume trades to have like a more secure way of doing transactions on large amounts than normal transaction signing allows you to do um, but kind of just like seeing this like quick adoption was very was very positive surprise and then we had Abo following up doing trades on Faso as well and some of the other bigger known downs as well. And I think there was like partially anticipated the, the focus to be more on Wales, but then the quick adoption by major DAOs was like really fun. So can I just add some up? Uh, yeah, so just because uh, you mentioned hooks, I want to clarify that uh, the things that they mentioned, post interactions, basically it's kind of the same. It's basically the same thing, uh, the hook, post interaction, so we have like similar ability to chaining wonders, to execute this and stuff. But it's also do a very good job thing for them for make available this for the users on the UI. So yeah, public hooks is post direction also there. Not to be confused on sanitation and this type of things. This pen is gonna get spicy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things that we've really been working on a lot recently is ERC7521, introducing that to the community as like a general standard for intent execution. And so our vision is that um, currently like the way intents are sort of all broadcast and, and submitted, so it's not necessarily one singular like cohesive ecosystem. And so there's uh, like complications around like if you're a solver, you need to be running like various software to like pick up each of these individual intents depending on like where it's coming from. And then activating those is also fragmented as well. So with 7521, and uh, we're doing a lot of research right now into sort of a dedicated mempool for 7521, and also just uh, a dedicated mempool in general. But to be able to aggregate all of these transactions, or excuse me, intents, um, that can achieve like significantly more efficient order flow. Um, and the more efficient order flow is, the more like with these intents you can bundle, which means like better outcomes for all of the users, um, which ultimately just satisfies everyone's uh, intents. And I think ultimately intents just should be satisfied, of course. Um, and for a user, like if they can get their intent satisfied in a very like seamless, quick way, um, without any issues or frustrations or, or having to be like hyper specific about what parameters they're submitting or, or how exactly they want that intent executed. Um, and they can just have it done, um, that will just be lead to a better outcome, not only for app application developers, but for users as well. Um, one very easy one, we improved our graphing algorithm. 
Um, some DEX aggregators were beaten between 0.7 and 1.5 percent now, which is great as a solvent, so we get more order flow. The second one is open sourcing a transaction simulation tool that anyone building in the intense ecosystem can simulate all the intents, all the call data, and we've also layered on top kind of a DSL. So we're able to specify what state transitions, what tokens should be validated with an off-chain, let's say, simulator before then it gets put on-chain. This is a very different approach than having kind of on-chain validation of intents. This creates more flexibility in that regard. The last but definitely not least one um, is a lot of state transitions. I, I said it in my talk earlier. I think a lot of intents are more focused on token A to token B. Our vision is intents are a lot greater in this regard. So maybe entering 50 pools, lending, borrowing, hedging your position on the iPort in one transaction. So recently we, uh, within our infrastructure, supported, uh, think about, uh, we supported SAFE, zero dev, economy, all four CC7 compatible smart wallets. And we also made the compatibility with uh, zero dev relayers, by economy relayers. So you can s express your intent of all your DeFi actions, get the call data, and then also relay. Thanks. Uh, we covered a lot already. Any questions? Uh, maybe to dig a bit more um, deeper. Where, because we see different approaches and we just heard um, some overlapping and some, some differences in the approaches of how the future of intents might look like. What is something that is perhaps, in your opinion, missing from the discussion or, or misunderstood? Like what is something that is not spoken about enough and, and where maybe you uh, think you have a different opinion to the uh, general discourse on, on intents? Um, yes. I think we covered quite a lot. Just maybe some, I know that, you know, the, while we do all this order complication or like this, on top of limit orders, I, I think like limit orders is the main use case. So that's the one we be like really First, we would see we need to see the really need from the user. I don't know to uh, transfers from intents or whatever, but a lot of hype around this. This is this really used for the three thirty seven. But just uh, <laughs> finding out that once we build this intent system, it becomes so complicated. There's also uh, application can include uh, embedded fees like for the execution, for the relays, so all the things. It's very nice to say you have made the guess, but then with over the complexity, you get some hidden conditions that could be uh, disturbed by the end user. So it's still like kind of a soft grain, kind of thing, but still. Yeah. What do you mean by hidden conditions? I mean, like, now you need to relay to execute your intent. Mm -hmm. So you signed it, and then how much you need to pay, how this price is built, right? Is now you need to see a Zazer scan that explain that it was batch transactions, that was your fee how much it was eventually charged through this protocol. It's like, we need very great UX to explain users what's really going on here. So what, so is, what is something that users are not seeing that might be hidden, uh, a hidden permission here? Like, what's an example of a hidden permission? I mean, the LA execution, right? So he, the, like, when you execute gas transaction, so it's a user that don't pay for the gas, right? Mm -hmm. You charge in the, in the some token for, you, you can, yes, you charge with the source token or destination token was from your swap. So you see the different rates. So you need to see how much like, your gas fees in the like, compared to native currency, mm -hmm. right? And if you do it cross chain intense, it's even more complicated system. So it was locked, unlocked, and we was like it was network of relays. So I would say it's really nice. I mean, good UX challenge to be very transparent here for everyone for the ecosystem players. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we go. All right. Thank you. Um, might be a little controversial at the intent, what the fuck sound like. Yeah, like. But um, I would say that intents are currently also a little bit overhyped. Like, just suddenly everybody is starting to talk about intents. It's become very, very popular. Um, and then I would say ultimately what really matters about intent is like, let's take it a little bit back to the basics. Like, um, it needs to be still, and that's where I would agree with you, like really like a more simple UX. So this is ultimately where at least we were coming from, right? 
We want to improve the experience for users. We want to make it easier for, do, for them to do transaction management. We want this difficult, complicated part taken away from them. So now if we start building on top like additional use cases with impacts, like we need to make sure that we still maintain that same UX experience and don't suddenly add complexity that we were trying to remove in the first place. Um, I really agree with that, and I think like UX is definitely something that it is broadly like we, we as an industry continue to make like more and more complex systems that allow you to take more and more complex actions, which is a good thing. However, like that tends to leave like a, a percentage of users uh, in the dust, uh, where they just aren't necessarily able to understand or or actually like continue operating on chain. Um, and I think that's a result of you know just this uh, massive machine we've all created to just like consume and create knowledge um, and just like constantly be researching like cool shit um, but one of the things that obviously like we've been thinking about as well is like UX and uh, specifically like a if you think of it like a graph you have like a desired execution and a desired outcome and if you go into like a very specific desired execution that becomes potentially like more difficult for a solver to fulfill because they have more variables to actually like pick up and include and say like, okay, yes, like if we think of like a swap, for example, um, if you're just swapping for like 100 ETH, people, please, please buy ETH. We need 2100, yeah, we'll just, um, <laughs> um, but if you think of that in terms of like desired execution, the more variables you put in, the more complex it is for a solver. Um, and that also requires a more sophisticated user. And so if we're, if we're always thinking about like, having to put in these like, very complicated intents, then it's just, it's not necessarily good UX. Whereas if you think of like, the ultimate a desired outcome, like uh, would be swap like 100 to 100 USDC or, or whatever, uh, 100, 2000 USDC, whatever. Um, like that becomes like significantly easier for a solver to fill but it also leaves like a lot of room for a solver to just like very quickly like pick that up and do it, and maybe it doesn't actually lead to the best outcome for the user. So there's like an inflection or uh, like sort of like a middle ground, where the intent is like complex enough to give a solver specific enough instructions to say like, okay, we're going to solve this to get exactly what you want. You need to give us just enough information, but not too much information, and determining that point along that that chart is something that I think like needs to be sort of like figured out, like exactly like what users want, what the threshold for how complex users want their interfaces to be um, versus like these interfaces that would just be like far too simple and at that point they just would like go to Uniswap or, or Dex or something and just say like, just do it. Semi related to UX as well, more about the information shown on the interface. Um, there's a lot of trust assumptions of constructing an intent. The user trusts the information shown on the information on, on the interface to submit their intent. So if they say APY is 5% or the price is X and so forth, and that's what they're shown and then they submit an order, then they're actually being forced into submitting an incorrect intent because they've been shown incorrect information. So I think one layer that we need to look at a lot more as an industry is the metadata layer. What does that look like? Who are we trusting to present this to the users to construct their intents? I think the other point for me is also smart accounts. I think we need to start transitioning a lot more to smart accounts to open up more complex DeFi actions, state transitions and so forth than just tokens. Um, yeah, we're just talking about tokens nowadays, but the chain is a lot more than just tokens. Hopefully we can this. Um, the, thir the third one is about solver distribution. So for an intent protocol, what do we suffice as quote unquote decentralized? I.e. is it okay to have one solver? Is it okay to have 10? Is it okay to have 50? What's kind of the balance of narrative versus reality um, yeah maybe on that because you both already have solvers what's your answer to pause that was the last question 
You mean to the transparency of data within the state? No, no, it's more like, what's the, what's, how, many how do you balance between uh, permission in solvers to having an open having as many solvers as there are? Like, what are the trade offs that you need to navigate um, when letting solvers onboard into your system? Uh, yeah, like the trade-off is obvious. If you like give like ability to everyone to solve, we have a traffic from the users. They take to execution and do not execute it or execute it at a very bad rate. So first, you need fair competition. All of the say, in our model, like the best price you execute, right? So they are equal, but uh, so it's like in the game theory. So the the one who take should provide the better worker. So one. So they compete to be the first to execute. That is the point. So, uh, in this sense, in that sense, we can allow to everyone. But uh, how to say? Um, it's like I would say it's very good things to be open. But at the same time, we need to kind of trust not to spam. Let's say our APIs, not to try to take this transaction and then how to say fail to execute this one. Um, like we. There is also the other topics, other class wars between the resolvers. It's about, <laughs> let's say, other things to cover. Okay. Uh, if, if builders, if, mm -hmm. I mean, how I understand Fusion, builders are basically taking care of the auction, right? The builder auction that takes care of navigating who is going to settle the, the, the user's order. So, how does it increase the, the likelihood of a settlement failing when you have more solvers? That's what you mentioned, right? Um, yes, I mean, if we have a lot, it's like, I'll say, from one side, it's always good that, um, I'll say, there's, we, like, what, from what we see, some resolvers has, like, they, they have dedicated training pairs. So they kind of do arbitrage with, with sex. So actually, through this, they have like, liquidity. So diversity is good. Um, but at the same time, we'll say, tech, tech challenges. So they try to execute, and then it's failed. So we hope we have, let's, Eventually, the like, user wait more because resolver spend gas and try to execute this one. It's like, a, 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 like no one can fill this order anymore. Or like if we get this. Also, the other thing we because we have partial fill was uh, our well, let's say intent orders. So we might see the situation when someone always feel like only half on the best price, and then like we have problem of the distribution of the like, lower ends through the resolvers. So, in general, my answer would be the diversity is right, especially if resolvers has different access to security, different protocols. It's, it's, it's also nice, I would say. Okay. Why, why would it fail more if you have more resolvers, if you're simulating the transactions? If you have four, you have 15, 20, why would it fail more for the more resolvers? I mean, they can take, let's say, some resolvers. Uh, again, it's about uh, also the API issues, about the distribution. So, some of them, say might be not available ah, but okay like we, we need I would say few but very good like a lot is constantly take and might try to execute but they might you know they try to execute and the transaction got rejected because uh, they you know have delays of the nodes they, they thought that it would fill order but eventually it was a transaction rejection because of the estimated whatever also, I would say few are good. It's a good convention for BF players. So, so the transaction, transaction goes through the private pool, not be front run, these kind of things. From your perspective, Thomas? Um, maybe to clarify a few points, because it almost sounded like the entire user money is at risk. And of course, it's only the, no. the, <laughs> the, the limit price of the user order is secure. And I think, it, I assume it's the same for when it's fusion. So what would be at risk is the slippage tolerance, right? That the user is allowing for. And um, that, I, I'm not sure how this one is, but in house of it's also secured in the sense that um, each solver is required to participate in the bonding pool. Um, so if they were to maliciously um, provide a quote, a price quote, and they wouldn't actually adhere to it, um, they would be slashed, and we would make sure that the user is being paid back. So why do you need the competition is if you only have one single server in the system, then they, are, they, can, they could basically quote at a very low price um, and wouldn't necessarily have the necessity to provide the user a better price, right? Like the, 
the whole idea behind the intent-based system is let's try to have a competition where the user gets the maximal possible uh, rate that is benefiting them. And so the stronger the competition, the more you have advanced competing mechanisms that are checking different on-chain price pools. Some of them also have their own private liquidity. And the more liquidity sources you're checking, the more likely you can actually provide a better price to the user. So you need this competition to push servers also to innovate and like to make sure that they continue adding on new existing liquidity pools. Because it's also somewhat of a complex task, right? Like a curve pool looks very different to Uniswap pool. So it is quite involved to actually make sure that your solver is able, the solver algorithm is able to tap into that liquidity and then also calculate what's like the right balance of like 60% submitted by one pool, 20% by another, another 20% by another pool. So you need competition. And um, then you probably also need specialized solvers because there might be certain trading types um, that are rarely being used. Um, so it might not necessarily play out for every solver. If there's a, I think Castle, we have like 17 solvers or so at the moment, yeah. something like that. And um, so it is quite important um, that those edge cases are also being covered because if 17 solvers all compete on it, but it's something that is only traded maybe once or twice per week, um, is it really worthwhile all the development efforts to incorporate a specific route? It wouldn't be. But if you're the only solver who does that, maybe it is. But so this is why it's like important to have like a variety of solvers with different skills, uh, with different private liquidity, with different skills of adding new liquidity faster, and like different specializations, and like this pressure to innovate and yeah, continue development. Um, to add on to that, I think very oftentimes uh, capitalism is thought in, of, in like a negative context in that it doesn't necessarily benefit the, the people within the system. However, like, a system where you have like a large number of solvers competing to like fulfill users and satisfy them is like sort of a, a, a different way of like looking at capitalism, where you have this, like, comp this competing system where everyone's just trying to like give the best outcome and the best result to a user to make them happy. Um, like that's objectively a good thing. So having like a, a as you were saying, like a good number of solvers that also do fulfill like specialized intents. Like, uh, if you have a group of solvers who are completely focused on swaps and like completing limit orders and whatnot, like that's great. But those solvers are, are I would say, like less likely to be able to fill like lending intents. If you wanted to like take out a loan on Ave or or any anywhere really that fills like a specific criteria, like let's say you want like a certain LTV um, or CR or something, and you were then to submit that intent to like the, the I'll, I'll just say like swap solvers. Um, it would potentially take them like longer to figure out exactly what they're going to do, and thus lead to like a longer you know wait time for the user. So having like a wide number of solvers that can fulfill a different range of, of actions is a very good thing. Um, yeah, we're one of these solvers. Um, we're more specialized in DeFi. Um, yeah, we, we like these edge cases. We also do the base tokens, but we also see that kind of expanding. That's our niche, if you say. <clears throat> I think it's good to have a whitelist of solvers to join the network as a start, since it's a fresh industry, they're fully open at the beginning. I think the lower amount of solvers or resolvers fillers, I don't think is beneficial to the protocol, nor the adoption of intents. It's more centralizing the flow, um, and it may even, even be centralizing it more to market makers. And yeah, I think it just limits our ecosystem. So I think having different specialties of solvers, similar to what you're saying, part of a network with more amount of solvers benefits us all in the long term. I just want to clarify these things against Ungonich because Council of give such good clarification on how this all works. So I also, also want to clarify how the application works here. So actually resolving is part of one each system tokenomics now. So we like have resolvers on board and resolvers should stay one each, so block them. And then they can resolve the traffic of the intent orders. It's one thing. Also, one, once one board resolvers, we ensure that like they have QIC, QIB things because 
we do not know, we don't want our users to get money from, I don't know, Northern Korea to their pockets through the one inch resolvers. So that's never happened here. So also at least it's important for the security concerns, different countries, regulations, etc. And initially I would say you know, the question was very good. Why? Like we just need to have more good resolvers and it's very true. Uh, we have a limit amount because initially we thought, hey, it would be very nice economics if based on uh, amount of stake, the resolver take uh, possibility to fill first, uh, then second, and etc. After we like, do the green votes in our governance, all the limits resolved. So now the resolver can fill it in the same time. In this sense, if they're whitelisted, they're trusted, they don't try to spam again our backend, not try to cheat users, the, we will be happy to have many good resolvers. But at the same time, you, if you have red resolvers on board, it's a problem for the users, etc. It's community in general. That's just my final clarification here. Yes. I think your older model was similar to like ABAC staking, and this is how a lot of math was done with ABAC. The more you uh, stake, the more the block is fast. Not, unfortunately, not aware of ABAC, but yet it's like this uh, time based things. But yes. we do these experiments and remote voting, and then we change the model. So maybe there will also changes after the governance protocol and after the governance, etc. Et et Thanks. Awesome, thanks, that was uh, illuminating. Um, so there's many trade-offs that you need to navigate when building these mechanisms. Um, on a more, on a lighter note, we've talked a bit about what the users want, the users want, or what the users want, they want better UX, the users want the best price. Um, maybe you have something to add to that, like what is your view of what your clients, um, the traders, um, and the different types of traders, what they really want. I mean, we see um, things like uh, the Telegram bots taking off very quickly and gaining lots of users. And I know that some people in DeFi are confused about their success. Um, and maybe you have something to add on how do you think about the needs of users? How do you prioritize them? Um, and maybe how are they different between different groups? Something that you like uh, like from what we see, like in Malaysia, we put a lot of traffic from professional traders. So the main reason is the gas price. So they go to the low gas fees, to the best roads, to the best execution. Uh, it's number one. <coughs> uh, I just think is what is always in our radar is like the gas efficiency. Like if there is the rates, the best rates. That is mostly here. So again, if we talk about 43, 37 users, there is a lot of smart wallets in the space we already integrate top two, I think, recently. So we do this adoption, uh, but like whenever someone has this extra 40 KS for 43.7 intent based wallet, like it's not a, like professional traders don't go there. There is now few adoption here. But as then we here on our radar if there is more smart smart contract based wallets comes. So we, yes, we would, like we see and going to just, I, I, I would say anticipate this Google account stuff if we have quite wide adoption. So that's what we need to build some more, again, revise with the gas efficiency stuff. This, this just come to my mind right, right, right now. So one, one thing you would add is gas list. It's basically something that you, the list. Uh, yes, like definitely. We just already work on this. Just we need to do it always more efficient because the, the professional players want to be more and more efficient. Yeah, it's good because we launch gases or others. Um, uh, I think our users mostly want the smooth sound. And other than that, we have a, quite a level way of like feedback collection from our users and I think honestly, rather than adding like more and more use cases that are actually really interesting and that we are working on as well is I think users just want also like a simple and also fast execution speed um, and I think that's definitely something that we will be tackling more next year also that, that execution while it's simple users usually are very impatient and sometimes don't even want to wait as long as like a minute or so, so um, speed is definitely something that we can improve, and it's kind of a trade-off also, like, like to provide the best execution and some of this, um, 
and at the same time a speedy execution, say of course if you would just forward it to one execution party, to, like if you forward to the one inch API or so on, it's like faster, but it's not necessarily the best execution you can get. Um, but we have already looked into this and there's ways that we can also improve significantly the speed on, on a house of intent system and that's something that we will tackle next year. So, uh, I have like a slightly unconventional example. Um, someone tweeted at us yesterday or, or today. Uh, they were like having an issue getting a taxi around uh, Istanbul. And they were like, can someone, is there like a solver that you can figure this out? And to a degree, that's, that's kind of what you would want. You want like to be able to submit intent to say like, I want to go X to Y. And obviously like the meme of Uber on chain is like, it's a meme. Um, however, but this idea of like a solver network being able to like pick up a user's intent to go from A to B and like provide them a solution for that is not a bad use case for what intent can be. This is obviously like very far from like the, the more like financial systems that we're you know, talking about here. But I think like intents, it can be broader than, than just swaps and, and specifically like on-chain financial interactions. Because ultimately it is just like a, a matching network for like figuring out what a user wants and how to get it to them in the most efficient way possible. Um, so our focus is still very much on providing like solid UX, solid tooling, solid infrastructure uh, for applications and wallets to be able to, to more efficiently interact and uh, provide intents for their users. Um, but these things, we're, we're just, you know, we're gnawing on them on the back end. What was the question again? The question is, um, what do users want? What, what do your users want? More DeFi. <laughs> every week, every day, we get requests, and you integrate this protocol, this action, this protocol. And we only build from user requests now. That's kind of how we manage it. The way that we prioritize it is the TVL, the volumetrics, the user base of people that would integrate us, and um, who wants to go to CowSwap to then do these trades as well. So for us, it's just purely user-based uh, development. And before, it was a lot more theoretical to get the launch, and then once you launch it, it's all user feedback. We, we don't have, let's say, um, don't have enough time to sit back and build for one year right now everyone just wants to, to integrate and have more DeFi at their fingertips so that's how we'll build it. Awesome. So gasless, faster, more reusable infrastructure and more coverage. Okay. Yeah. like cheap gasless because gasless don't go <laughs> like image be free. So then it's price. price. Then it's price. Effective price. Okay. price. Effective price. Okay. Yeah. So price net gas. Great. Um, then moving a little bit more into the future, uh, ultimately we will have to expand beyond our little DeFi bottle uh, to grow. So we will have to uh, compare ourselves to the traditional alternatives um, that any um, person has, and those are the banking apps, the trading apps, um, and what other alternatives you have to invest. Um, where do you think is the biggest delta in both directions? Like where do we have in the execution part the biggest advantage for my traditional finance? And, and where do we lag behind the most? And then perhaps on those points where we lag behind the most, how, what's the best solution to fix that? Um, yeah, nice <laughs> question. Because I think I already have some bias in the room, so like, I picked up too much better presentation of finance, but definitely I have the bias to do like all everything. Not everyone has that. Yes. Uh, yes, try to like think in outside. Uh, it's still like all this 437 smart wallets where you will uh, also on board on crypto with just your Gmail account or something. So this is like definitely, actually we go to this direction. Uh, one, one thing, so the, the benefits for me is like the cross-border 84 by 7 work is just amazing because I can never see in the banking space like we are locked, your transfer is stuck. Cross-border is like still like sometimes it's very challenging. Uh, plus accessibility is uh, like also like defines open market so I can go to the lending protocol, I can like take, buy this token, pools as a collector to other one, to like crazy mechanics, so also the options like 
the insurance for the prices is like uh, a lot of uh, deep things accessible just with my MetaMask wallet. I don't need something else. No need to go to some exchanges, say that I'm a certified investor or whatever. So the trans like accessibility is the work that is very missing. I think on the main side. Uh, yeah, but for us, like, we need more general public on board with 4637. I think that is the, the, the way to move. Yeah. Um, for me, one big promise of DeFi is uh, improving accessibility. And the other one is probably also removing, not, yeah, not only interest, but also fees. And like, if you think about one huge, um, financial topic and, and super like remittances and like generally exchanging um, currency, like international currencies, is like ridiculously type of fees that are being extracted just from having this market of like needing to exchange one asset for another one. And um, the fees take on there and like even like sending money, sometimes it's like 10% fee or whatever. Um, and the thing is, there are solutions for this that could be developed in CIFA, but I think there's just the CIFA system is already so advanced, and there's so many strong players that are benefiting from like this piece that they're not really incentivized, they're in power, and they're not incentivized to remove it. But with blockchain, we now have the ability to kind of revolutionize the system and come up with a better system and try it out. And so, uh, just thinking about the whole forex exchange um, examples, like think about instead of everyone individually swapping one asset for another one. Like you have like, if, if I want to exchange my US dollar into euros and someone wants to exchange their, their euros into US dollars. It's like, it, and this happens on a scale of like thousands and 10,000, 100,000 people on a daily basis. Um, so the this fee market is huge, it's ginormous. And ultimately it's like the normal retail user the, uh, who's suffering from this. And you can solve this with batching. If you were able to just um, put everyone who's in Europe who wants to exchange for US dollars and everyone who's in the US and in other countries where they use US dollars um, and want to buy a euro, if you would just all match those together, you could settle it and you wouldn't have to pay any fees. And this is something that blockchain is, a is able to enable and th this is huge. Um, yeah, and this is uh, something where we can really have innovation, but I think there's also risks right now. Um, at achieving this goal because you have other issues, you have issues such as MEV that are um, then other ways of extracting away from users, you have very high gas costs. Um, and these are um, your yeah, issues that are kind of circumventing this adoption that would enable us to bring this innovation. And so we need to make sure that we kind of find a way to, um, yeah, not hinder ourselves from gain more adoption by solving those other issues first. Um, I think one of the things that obviously we can move forward on and that like definitely just benefits the world as a whole is, well, Trevor is, uh, we're, we're moving towards like a scarce society in a way where um, we kind of just are hitting this point of uh, the world where it just resources are, are less abundant, it's more competitive, uh, people are having a harder time like achieving independent wealth. And it becomes like a more frantic search for people to be able to, to sustain themselves. Um, this is something that I, I don't think anyone disagrees is happening. Um, and in a way, like I don't want to say like, oh yes, like blockchain solves this because it doesn't immediately solve it by itself. But the tools that blockchain can provide, such as like DeFi, better access to remittance, cross-chain payments, like everything like that, it just like improves the status of these these people. Uh, and enables them to just like not necessarily have to deal with predatory centralized institutions um, like Western Union, who charges 15% or so. It's ridiculous. Um, and that exists like exclusively to prey upon people. Um, whereas with, with DeFi, like incredibly, if not like microscopic fees to do the, the exact same actions that actually happen faster, it's just a better, a better way of, of doing things. Um, I don't, know, I don't I don't want to like get too doomer on this. So I'm just gonna So I used to work for a Swiss institution 
it was about. So TradFi slash crypto. All I can say is this industry is a lot better. <laughs> I don't think we should be really catering to that to a certain degree. If we do want, let's say, more TradFi to use DeFi, it's going to take years. Um, I tried pushing it three years ago in the crypto bank, the regulation and so forth. You need to have KYC pools, KYC counterparties. It's not really decentralized finance. It's going to be maybe a different ecosystem of KYC, DeFi. The one improvement we can definitely make on the solver side is speed. Um, solvers can respond within, let's say, eight, nine seconds. I think we should be responding within 200 milliseconds. So that's an improvement we can definitely make. The kind of abstraction for kind of the retail users, definitely as well, for the gas abstraction. I think holistically, just having more use cases for the real world person to interact with this ecosystem. So showing the benefits and abstracting all the logic or blockchain away from them. I've got a spicy comment also to say. I think ironically with intents over the years, we are going to some degree recreate the traditional finance infrastructure with many different middlemen. You'll have intent protocols, you'll have solvers, you'll have solvers of solvers, everyone specializing in different parts, and we will create many different middlemen within this ecosystem as well. Dropping the mood quite considerably here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then up it again. Um, so we heard you need to be easier to onboard, you need to be faster, uh, and we need to be very conscientious of not repeating the mistakes of RadFi and enabling better coordination. With a kind of traction, not only easy on board, but very similar, same experience traditional clients have with, let's say, access level to different abstractions. I just a few talks very quick here that it's like guys who are trash and they use this with access level, so banking accounts and the deposit store accounts. So, so that's not harder to onboard than it is in any other app. Yeah, just once you're onboard, it's not only for the retail user to onboard, it's more for also for the, so more professional players, again, traders, they need the features that they need to uh, sex world, ah, okay. this game, why there will say explanation of abstract accounts. Okay, great. Um, in, in, the, in the more utopian discussions, intents are often spoken of as a paradigm, right? a new way of protecting altogether, and there's much more than just a limit order. It will actually perhaps have a societal change. And um, I wonder if there's something, if you think there's something to this, like do intents and solving this intense solving separation of the paradigm. Do they enable new forms of social coordination? Are they an important part of blockchains and how we can bring blockchains to a wider audience? Like, will this improve um, and will this perhaps change how we think about coordinating exchanges amongst each other? Yeah. Oh yeah, we can, we can, we can, we can change the audience. Yeah. I love taking all the knowledge and then doing something at the end, but I'll start this thing. <clears throat> um, social coordination within intents. I, I think, let's say, autonomous intent agents, so being able to define your parameters and, let's say, have a bot act on your behalf for financial transactions is very interesting. Maybe not within social coordination. However, to bring the good down again, it's quite dangerous with intents, as you are declaring what you would like to do, and this information can be used against you. So my recommendation is do not scan your eyeballs, even if you get $50 paid to scan your eyeball, as certain information of your previous intents and previous transactions on chain can be used to create a behavioral analysis and characteristics of you which maybe in the future there could be some gatekeeping of intent protocols to stop you from interacting based upon your prior transactions. Social coordination, maybe you could even have payroll every single month, just transferring the funds. You could also have an intention um, of splitting a bill, for example, at a restaurant that automatically, once you've given the approvals, all four parties will split it. So in that area, I think it could be quite interesting. 
I, I would love to see like the, the last one because the whole credit card shuffle, it's just it, no one ever enjoys it. Um, I think, yeah, in, intent's gonna be applied to a lot more than just on-chain, like financially oriented transactions. Like, because ultimately, I, I think I mentioned this earlier, it's like you're, you're putting something out there and you're just asking someone to figure it out for you. And that is something that we do every day with literally like everything we do, be it um, interacting with like calling it a cab or, or whatever. Um, but like, let's say you wanted to get concert tickets and you're just like, I want Taylor Swift tickets, please. And this is the, the price I'm willing to pay. And instead of like going through Ticketmaster, who's going to charge you like, I don't even know, too much. Um, you instead have a solver can like identify a counterparty that has put up their tickets on like some third party site with like an incredibly low fee, identify that, grab it for you and send it to you. And you can just do all of this, of course, like theoretically like from a wallet which already has your funds, their, your key, or not your keys, but like your permissions are signed over, and it's just executed on your behalf. Um, so anything that allows people to just like more easily do what they want to do, uh, that they would be doing every day, is a huge improvement. Um, on the social coordination side, um, I'm not really sure. I think there's like definitely uh, realms of research that need to be done to like delve into, I think also like what people want to, to, to figure out like how exactly we, we want to um, move forward in that area. Uh, I do like the idea of like an autonomous agent that can execute things on your behalf, um, thinking on how all of these like AI wearables are starting to pop up, not to like be like, yo, AI crypto, let's fucking go. But um, I think there, there's something to be said for that. There's, it's like an interesting area that, that should be explored. I think it's a very, popular question these days of like what are like future use cases of intent where can we take it what would it enable um but i also think like by answering that and like spinning some different fantasies around i'm also contradicting my previous response of like i think intents are currently a bit overhyped and we should at least for now think back at the basics and like getting the basics right so I'm kind of like, I don't want to like, oh, yes, I have ideas, and yes, I think like, yeah, for things like better coordination, for simple things, even as ticketing, et cetera, and like, um, you can also take it like more, right, you can kind of like the ring trade, so you don't have, maybe you have a Taylor Swift ticket, someone else doesn't like Taylor Swift, once you go to Britney Spears, whatever, you can't like, have a circuit track of those, but like, let's, let's not get, get ahead of ourselves, like let's get the basics right, let's build where we are here right now with good UX, um, and then take it from there. Yeah, definitely, I agree, I agree here, that this, the question initially, but like, philosophical, what is the future for the farming machine, would we have decentralized Uber? You're building it, we care, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, like for me it's kind of a more simplified view, like whatever would be economically efficient, let's say if we achieve, again, like, Better price, better efficiency with uh, swaps with uh, this with this seven without gas overhead. So whatever is economically efficient also right. So we want to see this really we place it just we need to see how it's reach. So this is plenty of idea in space and uh, the one which efficient was right, that's the uh, answer. So now we focus on the good UX, the efficiency and this is like what we do right now. Awesome. And uh, so I think that concludes Wait until the stratosphere. Mm -hmm. If anybody has some closing questions, now is the moment. I have a question, uh, kind of back to the solver competition uh, discussion. Um, I think Connie mentioned earlier that you know uh, the solver profitability is kind of an issue, and you know many of these solvers are uh, subsidized by you know, free infrastructure, and so you know maybe this question is mostly applicable to kind of uh, the cow swap of the Nordic system, but. How are you guys thinking about this problem that, you know, if these solvers are more profitable and they you know, end up disappearing uh, and, you're, and you're relying on solver competition, um, you know, how are you dealing with that potential problem? I mean, I guess it's actually a very interesting question for the solvers here because they have really the perspective from like the solvers have water and send us up. And I think it's actually really interesting to compare the incentive mechanisms also not only between Manage Fusion and Castle, but also um, Uniswap X. Um, so particularly right now, we do it. When we initially started, there was no solver 
ecosystem around where it just didn't exist, so we needed to bootstrap it. How did we bootstrap it? Is by uh, paying out incentives. And so currently, incentives are given out at like rewards as on a weekly basis, split um, across three categories. It's essentially for continuity. Um, it's for how much better is your solution compared to the second best solution, because obviously, like, um, it's important, like, if, if you are only providing a solution that's one cent better than the other solution, then it's not adding that much value. And then lastly, also, like, basically ensuring that uh, price feed is being given to the users. And, um, yeah, this is being paid out on a weekly basis. It looks like our servers are happy. That's uh, <laughs> uh, so currently paid in cow. I think also the current um, up swing of cow chicken prices also uh, probably helping them to be more happy about it. Um, but yeah, the, so basically, we're also thinking about moving away. Like, let, let's see, but um, we have recently talked about starting to potentially um, take small fees, and especially on order types where we offer value that no other orders in the ecosystem do. Um, for example, limit orders is something where everybody else is filling at the limit price, and in cost of you can get a better price than your limit price. And this is where we would start charging some fees from, because you would still be better off than trading anywhere else. And there's, there's definitely a possibility um, when servers start charging the fees in, like, for car protocol, um, they could also consider how does I think currently the case on Fusion and on non Uniswap X to essentially take some fees from user orders directly. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, just okay, it starts from the beginning from the results. We also have a similar journey as Bootswap, so with, uh, we have an initial incentive program for resolvers for the Bootstrap, so incentives not weekly, maybe monthly or something. So then we finish this incentivized program. Program. So we, uh, as I remember, some resolvers was dropped off. I mean, so they like was get get out from this <laughs> party because uh, the but the efficient resolver has stayed. So uh, our resolvers is the resolvers who take profit out of this. Let's say efficient resolving do some uh, like how say combining the word coincidence of once year. <laughs> yes. The, the name of course of here. So the uh, yeah, the efficient one stays, and we finish this our incentive program. Regarding the fees, we don't include any fees from the user profit here. So the resolver should cover the gas expenses. They they pay for the gas for the execution of gas orders. So they submit transaction. They have efficiency if they combine let's say big orders. So that if they combine ten orders in one transaction, so they pay gas once. It's like still like not the same price, but it's cheaper if they send transaction by one by one. So here's the efficiency plus. They might have access to the tax, tax liquidity. And that's, I don't know some advanced trading algorithms. So the short answer: the one who make profit out of this are stay in this resolving and serve our users. Yeah. I don't think it's just making profit. I think some solvers are trying to capture more of the market as well. So uh, I know some solvers that are losing money every month just to be part of the ecosystem and continue. <clears throat> Regardless of the token rewards and the percentages that you're generating in fees, um, people have big teams to be solvers, resolvers to propose this ecosystem. I have a follow-up question because we do have two solvers here and then you mentioned also um, the solvers that are making money out of it, they're staying. Um, so how about Enzo and Fulpella Hats? Um, Fulpella Hats and Enzo. Like, what is, are you currently on Fusion? What are your thoughts on economic? You can go first. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm asking questions. <laughs> um, first on the, the question of well, how do solvers um, make revenue, I think we covered the basics uh, amongst the arms between Anna and Artyom. Um, but I also think that the, the future of solver business model is still being worked out. Uh, obviously, and as Connor mentioned, many solvers are now um, increasing their bids to win flow and not necessarily focusing on short-term profits and because it is a long-term game. Now, I think uh, Connor and, uh, 
and, and I were both very good solvers. Uh, but we're currently not on, on one distribution um, because the hurdle is a bit too much to buy $1 million of uh, one inch tokens. But I do see that this model is continuously being um, developed and that there are being changes made, right? Recently you made a change. Uh, so perhaps in the future it will be easier to, to enter that, uh, that set of resolvers. Yes, so we're both too expensive. <laughs> the, the rewards to the, the cost of decaying of one inch token and exposure is too much. Um, that's it. We would love to do it, but it, there's not enough incentive, incentive, incentive alignment or solvers. Yeah. Here it goes the answer from the solver itself. Why is it do resolving or why is it don't? So some of them will take, can take profit, some of them see the levels are high, some has algorithms, some other liquidity, etc. And yeah, the, just also the last, the, how the rules can be changed, government, by DAO can promote. And also, it might be different incentives for the results to be a part of uh, resolver systems or, or not. This is like also not the one answer. It depends on the protocol, on the, on the DAO, on the rules, etc. So, yeah. Are you looking to incentivize specialized solvers? <laughs> well, I think the answer to the question is it's still being worked out. Yeah. And um, we're still looking for the ideal mechanism. It's kind of a leading thing. We'll look forward to the next uh, next iterations on all the mechanism designs and what we will be building. And with that, closing this panel. Thanks everyone for the great. <laughs>